Today we're entering into the Donald Trump legal problems universe. Now there is currently a lot of people prosecuting the ex-president for a lot of different reasons. And it's getting to the point where it's a little bit hard to keep track. With the FBI kicking down doors and Trump pleading the fifth, I thought I'd create a drama free episode to just sort of keep everything straight. So first legal problem on the docket, the now infamous Mar-a-Lago classified documents issue. Turns out Donald Trump being the avid reader that he is, couldn't get enough of these classified documents and might have brought some of them home with him. The legal issue here? Well, unlike every other issue in this episode, this part's going to be a little bit more like me describing a movie after only having seen the trailer. I can tell you what the basic plot's going to be, but whew, man, there is almost guaranteed to be quite a few twists that are going to come out later on. Now this paperwork case is, ironically, pretty late on paperwork right now. Long and short of what we know about this situation, federal law bars the removal of classified documents to unauthorized locations. A bunch of boxes of classified documents were confiscated from Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort earlier with suspicion that there were a few more floating around in the background. Then the FBI conducted this raid to look for and collect those additional documents. That's pretty solid evidence that, well, there were additional documents down there. A federal grand jury requested by the Justice Department has been investigating the presence of potentially classified documents at Mar-a-Lago since at least early May of 2022. Now, unfortunately, there were two words in that last statement that are the bane of every legal reporter's existence, grand and jury. That means your article is going to be including a lot of phrases like experts are saying and reporters are taking pot shots in the dark. Basically, a secret group of people are in the process of collecting and then reviewing evidence with the intent of eventually seeing which, if any, criminal charges they are going to be recommending a prosecutor to pursue based on the evidence that they've collected and reviewed. Now, of course, behind all this, that's where you get the real controversy, because we're approving all this evidence collection under the flag of seeing if classified information was moved outside the White House to an unauthorized location. Simple fact of the presence of documents. If, of course, in the pursuit of random classified documents and unauthorized locations, investigators were to stumble onto something else incriminating, either the contents of one of those classified documents or evidence of any other crime, well, that can be reviewed by the grand jury as well when discussing which charges to approve. They're not bound by just recommending prosecutions based on the illegal retention of classified documents. That's just the starting point. So right now, we don't really know exactly what they're looking for or what they've found. The secrecy required for Justice Department investigations and grand jury proceedings means that the country will have to be patient. The justifications for the search may become public only if and when criminal charges are filed. So all we do know right now is that all of this is happening under the umbrella justification of misplaced classified documents. Some of the tea leaves right now are certainly coming up nuclear secrets though, so oh boy, this could become very interesting in the next few months. Next case, and we're going to my backyard, New York. Trump and his kids are currently pleading the fifth in a state civil investigation looking into tax fraud. You see, he has the right to remain silent, but now the jury is out as to whether he has the ability to do so. So let me emphasize that this is not a federal issue. It's New York's Attorney General and a state court. Now the case here revolves around the value of Trump's properties when it comes to taxes and things. Basic problem, it's never a good sign when your answer to the question, how much is that property worth, is Who's asking? If it's the tax man, this property is dirt cheap. I want to pay as little as possible in property taxes. If on the other hand it's a bank looking to approve me for a loan, 
Well, this building is one of the most expensive properties in all of Manhattan. You see, the attorney general in this case, well, she has some incredibly strong evidence that the Trump administration was fudging the numbers when it comes to asset valuations based on who they were sending those asset valuations to. The problem is, they don't have a solid case that Donald Trump himself had knowledge that the Trump organization was doing that. The majority of the state's evidence relies on the fact that Trump has yearly signed financial statements with those fraudulent numbers. Now love him or hate him, but Trump doesn't really strike me as the kind of guy who reads the terms and conditions before clicking I accept. Someone's going down for this crime, but it might be an accountant instead of the guys whose name is on all of the buildings. So next. We're heading down south to Georgia to review another state prosecution of Donald Trump. Now this, it's also still in the grand jury phase of things. Unlike the classified documents investigation though, we have a pretty good idea of the scope and the potential charges here. You see, the goal of this state investigation is to figure out whether Donald Trump tried to illegally interfere in Georgia's 2020 election results, and if he did, which charges to recommend to prosecutors based on the reviewable evidence that they have. Now, This investigation broadly covers two separate topics. First, just another perfect phone call, where Trump, post-election, might have, or might not have, tried to pressure Georgia's Secretary of State to find the specific number of ballots voting for Trump that would have pushed him over into an election victory in Georgia. And second, he got this weird scheme to try to send a fake electors to the Capitol that would have voted for Trump instead of Biden. So first, the phone call that's so notorious at this point it has its own Wikipedia page. Now the drama of this phone call is that Trump is threatening Georgia's Secretary of State with the entire weight of his Department of Justice if that Secretary of State didn't take actions to, post election, produce more ballots voting for Trump. Now stop me if you've heard this one before, but in order to prove that this is election fraud, well you have to prove intent. Did Trump really believe that Georgia's election had been rigged and Rathesberger was actually just sort of protecting Biden? Or was he kind of making coded threats in his own self interest? Now, if only we had some sort of clairvoyant attorney to prove some of this stuff. In this call, though, there might have been a little slip up for Trump that the prosecution is latching onto. You see, Trump at one point cites a specific number of ballots that Rathensberger should be on the hunt for. Not an amount from any sort of conspiracy theory, but rather just the amount that would have shifted the state over to him. Now, essentially, because of that slip up, the prosecution sort of paints in this conversation as Trump saying, All right, find all the illegally suppressed votes for me. Or, if you don't want to do all that, just find this many votes and call it a day. Is that enough to prove a corrupt intent? Don't know. That's the job for the Georgia State Grand Jury and several judges through the indefinite appeals process that this case is going to go through. Now, the other piece to this puzzle is the fraudulent electors. Now, this is the part of the investigation that Rudy Giuliani is just calling in sick to avoid testifying about. In an ideal world, the way the electoral process works is, your party wins the vote in the state, which means that your party gets to send their slate of pre-prepared electors over to Washington, where those electors are going to be casting a vote for the candidate of their choice. Now, 99.9999% of the time, that elector is going to vote for the candidate of their party. because. Well, the party does quite a bit of a vetting process before they submit their slate of electors. Now, what the Trump team was trying to do was, all right, Democrats won in Georgia, so their electors are going to be going to Washington distributing Georgia's Democratic votes. Why don't we just sort of send the B team of Republican electors to Washington as well? You know, just to see how far they can get. 
Now, because of this, you had 16 uninvited Georgia guests just sort of floating around outside the Capitol building, insisting that their names should be on the list. Now, this strategy to get these fake electors into the building was a bit throw all the junk at the wall and just sort of hope something sticks. A uh, problem was the Georgia secretary and all of the other relevant officials had already certified the election, so there wasn't a ton of wiggle room. But basically, at some point on January 6th, when all the state electors' votes were going to be counted, someone out there had to find a way to play an Uno reverse card. Basically, you're trying to get Congress to turn over Georgia's electoral nominee process from the raw popular vote to a sort of emergency vote of Georgia State Congress. Ideally, Georgia State Congress could say something along the lines of, whoa, 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 whoa. Voter fraud has cocked up this election beyond repair, and it's too late to have a new state election. And furthermore, the Constitution gives state congresses vast power over how electors are appointed in their states. We're just going to sort of follow our hearts and give an alternative Republican slate of electors the W, because we really think that's what people wanted. No evidence that any of this would have happened if it got turned over to Georgia State House, but we're really hucking Hail Mary after Hail Mary on this one. Now there was an effort to sort of get Mike Pence to block certification of the electoral votes, and maybe after that get a majority of Congress to object to the vote, heck, maybe you storm the Capitol and see if you can get something to shake out that way. Depending on how you view reality, this could be seen in two different ways. Is it a criminal election subversion of Georgia law, or is it just a guy fighting for what he believes in? It's the type of advice your idiot friend would give you before doing something really stupid. It's only a crime if you think it's a crime. The biggest weak link in the prosecution is that it's going to be hard to prove Trump's state of mind, since he can argue that he didn't think he was doing anything wrong, and hence, not breaking the law. So that's all out of the great state of Georgia. Now to the final investigation, the Department of Justice probe into January 6th and the 2020 election. Now this, we're back to federal again. In this criminal probe, it's a bit harder to explain than the others because of its sheer size and secrecy. We're investigating crimes that went on in the 2020 election. That encompasses everything out there. From charging, and in some cases convicting, January 6th protesters, to all sorts of backroom investigations and uh, just sort of 2020 election stuff. Can you connect it to the election? Sure, we'll take a look into it then. Now, reporters have spent a lot of time trying to read the tea leaves of this one as well. Who got subpoenaed? Alright, well then clearly they're investigating that crime. To me though, well, it all just feels like a big amorphous blob until we actually get some significant charging documents out of it. The main point that I want to highlight about this criminal probe is that it's not the January 6th committee. It's definitely running on the same track, but there are a few main changes. Now, the first is that the January 6th committee is tasked with a specific goal, researching future legislation. All right. We're going to figure out just what the heck happened on the day and then write a new law to keep it from ever happening again. Simple. The Department of Justice probe on the other hand, well that's the fist of the law going around and looking for someone to punch. More specifically, looking for crimes that it can prosecute. Now the other major difference is that the January 6th probe is Congress, while the Department of Justice is the executive branch. Now that might sound like, to most of you like an incredibly unfun fun fact, but it carries with it a major legal benefit to researchers. Specifically, Meadows and a bunch of other members of the Trump administration have refused to testify in front of Congress, specifically citing a separation of powers. Not sure if it's a winning argument, but if your goal is to just waste a whole bunch of time, checkmate. Now with the DOJ investigation on the other hand, well we trace the call and it's coming from inside the White House. 
those separation of powers arguments suddenly got a whole lot harder to make. It's all the same power. So those are the investigations into Trump right now. We got a grand jury probe into misplaced classified documents. We have a New York tax fraud case. We got a Georgia election interference case. And finally, cherry on top of it all, we got a federal election interference case. I hope this does a bit to clear up who is investigating what and why they're doing it. Because, wow, I realize this stuff is complicated, overlapping, and coming at you real, real fast. My hope is that the next time you see a news update, you'll know which of these many investigations it's relating to. Until we get some sweet, sweet charging documents, though, thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Now, before I go, I just want to take an opportunity to say, sorry it took me so long to put out this episode, but my computer just got totally bricked. Luckily, I had the photoshopped images for this video backed up, but not sure I'm going to edit the images for the next episode yet, because I don't have Photoshop on the computer that I've just ordered and is supposedly coming on Wednesday. If you guys know of a Photoshop alternative for basic editing, I mean, I'm not looking to repaint the Mona Lisa here, just shift a few articles over to get the ads out, let me know in the comment section. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.